All right, here we are starting things up again. <laughs> okay, um, so we are here on the same Zoom as before. Mike is sharing out that Zoom. We did have some technical issues. Um, all my audio looks good on my side, So, but it did last time. I'm going to wait and see if Mike has anything more to say about that. He said it's like robotic distortion, uh, which is a problem. So if that's the case, then we might just have to postpone. There's nothing I can do about technical issues. It's, it's, it's life. Um, but yeah, everything is looking good. So if you are joining, if this is uh, a new... Uh, tutorial Tuesday for you here. Uh, we're live streaming on YouTube and that's where the technical snafus I thought were starting. And then it was a mic issue. So I don't know, a microphone issue, not mic, my production guy issue. Um, okay. So uh, Joe here from Copy Hackers. We are, I'm just going to wait and see if I can get some feedback from Mike on how we're doing here because there is a delay. Mike's in our Edmonton office. I'm at home in Kelowna. Um, I can't fly out <laughs> for everything, every tutorial Tuesday, sadly. So we're hoping to work some uh, some kinks out. All right. So we have some people in here in the Zoom room. Hello. We are, again, attempting to uh, live stream to YouTube. Okay. We're starting again. We're going to delete the old one off of YouTube. Um, yeah. If you're here in Zoom, hello. If you're on YouTube also, hello. Slight delay there. Um, fantastic. So we're starting all over again. Start from scratch. Uh, I have already presented the first few slides of this, but we're just going to go again since the audio was la garbage. Um, all right. Today we are in this tutorial Tuesday. We're kind of backing up to something that I don't I've been told I don't teach uh, that much. And that is introductory copywriting. So what do you do when you are first starting out? Now, this is the lesson that I wish I'd had when I was first starting out, because a lot of times we hear about uh, when you're writing copy and you're just getting started, even if you're a marketer or somebody else who's kind of been thrust into the role of like, I'm a copywriter and I didn't even know I was. Um, we we're kind of taught features and benefits and this like really basic stuff. And like, it's just not much more beyond that, right? So I find it like, once you know about features versus benefits, like done, lesson learned, right? But like, there's more to copywriting, a lot more to copywriting than that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna back up. Uh, we're gonna go back to old timey <laughs> uh, copywriting. That's like really early copywriting by the great, John Caples. So John Caples was a copywriter way back in the early 1900s. And we're going to look at his very famous ad and break that down. So one of his very famous ads, but this one in particular, you may recognize. And if you don't, it'll be a really good introduction to copywriting just to like be able to walk away knowing that this ad exists. Um, and you can Google it and see it yourself, etc. So we're going to back up and break down that ad so that you can get started as a newer copywriter, as a founder who isn't used to writing copy, as a marketer who maybe has had copywriting thrust upon them and they've been kind of doing it, but not really confidently doing it. So we're going to get into that. I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully uh, that isn't the way that uh, my audio got garbled last time, but Mike is on here as a panelist here in Zoom to let me know. And he's also slacking me if anything else goes wonky. So do bear with us. Um, all right. So John Caples, this is the ad that I'm talking about. You can see up in the little in the corner up here, it says 1927. Uh, that was when the ad uh, came out. Uh, this was, and it was used again and again and again, right? But this is the one that's been captured and is likely if you do a Google search for this headline, you will see this ad. So if you want to do that too, feel free to, you can follow along on your own screen, uh, just going into Google images and looking at it. But this is an ad that was written in the early 1900s. We will break it down so that you have vocabulary, you have a basic um, way of looking at the structure of a uh, page that has been copy written. So instead of doing the thing that a lot of people do, which is I'm going to go and look at websites and see what they're doing. And that's kind of the observation part of writing copy, which is good. Um, 
it's also good to back up to like this early stuff, the foundational stuff that everybody's kind of been riffing off since then um, and really see what was going on here so that we don't make the wrong assumptions about what works and so that we can get really good at writing copy. Okay, but first of all, <laughs> what the hell is copywriting? What even is it? So copywriting is, this is a really basic definition. It's using the written word phrasing and persuasion to get the yes. So we're trying to get the yes, whatever the yes is, it can come in various forms. The yes can be a click like, yes, I want to read more. The yes can be a form submission. It can be opening an email is a yes. It's saying yes to the subject line. Yes to the from name. So we are working to get our prospect to take action, small actions and big actions, because the ultimate yes is of course, becoming a paying customer, upgrading, buying more from you, all of those great things. Now, if you are writing any marketing materials at all, whether it's a Facebook ad, meta ad, or um, a video sales letter, a VSL, like there's lots of different things you're going to be writing as a copywriter. Doesn't mean you have to write all of them. Just know that they're all over the place. Then you are copywriting or writing copy. Importantly, this is an important distinction if you are newer to copywriting. It's not pluralized. You don't pluralize copy. It doesn't become copies. You don't write copies. As soon as you say that, it sounds like you are brand new to this. It's not pluralized. It's just writing copy or copywriting. You write copy. It's not even, you don't even put A in front of it. It's not like a noun that way. You can't add like multiples or make it singular. It just is write copy. It's also not market. It's not law. It's not copyright. It's copyright with right on there being the important part. W-R-I-T-E, copyright. Okay. That's what copywriting is, the core of it. Oftentimes we are asked, um, can you teach me how to write a blog post? And I'm like, well, no, because I'm, I mean, I might write blog posts, but that's not copywriting. So content writing and copywriting are two different things. Content writing is often like a blog post, an ebook. Now that doesn't mean that content writing isn't under the umbrella of copywriting. The fact is that newspapers call their written words copy. So we do refer to almost everything that's written on a screen or on a page that's not like a novel as copy. So because of that, it's really easy to blur the two. But when you are learning to write copy, you are learning to write something that gets the yes. That's an important distinction. So a content piece such as a blog post might be like trying to get more clicks or like the headline might be copy written because it's trying to get clicks, but maybe it's a listicle of like 10 ways to do X, not necessarily copywriting unless there's a call to action at the end, unless you're trying to move people to say yes, in which case you're not really writing a blog post anymore. Now you're writing something more that's like a sales page, but you didn't know it and you kind of disguised it, which is a lot of what we're going to see in John Capel's work. So there is a blur between content writing and copywriting. Just know that um, a copywriter and a blogger are not the same thing. And a lot of bloggers graduate to copywriting, which I hope doesn't minimize <laughs> blogging by saying graduate to it. But we do see people coming into copy school, which is our program at Copy Hackers. Um, we see a lot of people from a blogging background who are really tired of selling a blog post for, you know, a hundred bucks or 300 bucks and they put so much work into it um, and they want to get into copywriting, which is really high value, largely because it does get the yes. It gets people to say yes, which is very valuable to businesses. Okay. Now, what is a copywriter then? What is this person, this John Capel's entity? What am I? What are maybe you? Uh, what is a copywriter? This is not a writer first. I want to make that distinction. It's a professional salesperson who uses the written word to get the yes. Okay. That means that they are a salesperson first um, and a writer second. I would say second and possibly even further down. Yes, you're going to be a better copywriter if you're able to phrase things well so that it's easier to move through your copy, um, but you're a salesperson first, and that's an important distinction. Oh, 
Now, if someone hires you to be a copywriter, they want you to write ads, write emails, write scripts, webinars, web pages, even in-app copy. You're going to be writing any, any place where cash changes hands, as my friend Rai Schwartz like to say, likes to say, that's where a copywriter is needed. So if you are hired as a copywriter, this is what they're hiring you for. They see you as a professional salesperson who uses the written word, that's me pulling the written word over, uh, to get the yes. Now, within the written word, there's going to be a lot of persuasion techniques, insights into human decision making. As you write for the web in particular, you're going to have to think about um, the persuasion architecture and how your message is laid out, how you're moving people from line to line, knowing that they're being distracted by so many things. So we have a really tough job to do today, but we're up for the challenge. Okay. This is a good line. If I know that there are a lot of people who just want to come into this copywriting world because you like get paid to write and it's absolutely true. You do. However, you do have to recognize that like if you're a writer and you want to be you want to get paid to write that's cool write your novel on the side keep it off in a wonderful folder go look at it go write it after hours um but that that novel writing stuff the fiction stuff the really voice heavy stuff uh is likely to get in your way if you think of your job as artistry or as writing first. It's really not. Now, you will use a lot of writing techniques, such as great storytelling, in order to get people to say yes. But keep in mind that this exact line, you're not an artist, Peggy, you solve problems. That is, you can learn a lot from Mad Men as well. If you're just starting out as a copywriter or you're newer to the whole thing, go back, watch Mad Men a second time, hopefully. Um, hopefully you've already watched it because it's fantastic in so many ways. All right, let's break down what's going on in this ad in such a way. Now we're not going to get into the nitty gritty of it. We're going to do like the introduction stuff. So what is John Capel's teaching us about the basics of copywriting so that you can start on a better foot than just saying like, here's a feature, here's a benefit and that kind of stuff, which is like, you can Google your way through that in like an instant. That's not the valuable stuff. This stuff is, this is what you need to know. This will distinguish you. Okay. We're going to start out with the least important part. <laughs> and that is that this is an advertorial. So there's this whole thing called advertorials, which is like an advertisement combined with editorial, and it often shows up in newspapers and magazines. We don't see a lot of these anymore, but if you're wondering about this important line at the top that says money-making opportunities section, that's because it was an advertorial. It wasn't just, it was it was an ad that's masquerading as something um, more important than an ad so that people are more likely to read it. And this is where long copy comes in. You'll see that this is much longer than what you're otherwise used to seeing for an ad. And that's largely because it's an advertorial. It can fit in in that way, but long copy also works, which is why people invest in advertorials. Okay, that's at the top. Now, we have a hero image. When you're writing copy, especially for the web, you are going to have a hero image. Call, this is what it's called. Just know that that's what like the primary image in your ad is your hero image. This is also true on a web page. The image up at the top is your hero. The hero is the thing that's seen first, okay? Basically, this is kind of sort of an image caption because um, it's an image caption as we understand it is often supposed to explain the image. But what John Caples is doing is recognizing that people look at the caption on an image and instead of defining or describing what's in the image with the caption, um, this caption is making you want to read more. So the caption goes, can he really play? A girl whispered, heavens no, Arthur exclaimed. He never played a note in his life. Now that makes you want to read a bit more, right? And that's an important note. Just because something's called a caption and should have a sort of function that you believe it should have. In fact, everything is copy. Everything that you're writing is designed to get, to pull people in further so that they're more likely to say yes. So that's the image caption. And I said, kind of, because it's important to note that it doesn't meet the um, user experience or UX criteria of what a caption should be. All right. This is the biggie. This is the one that everybody has knocked off a thousand times over. It's the headline 
Also with your headline, you are likely to have your hook. It's very unlikely that you are going to write a headline that's not also your hook. So what is a hook? Hooks grab attention. They are powerful enough that you can't look away even if you want to. So they laughed when I sat down at the piano, but when I started to play is a hook because there's this emotional tension of what's going on here. They laughed, leading with this moment of possible humiliation, right? They laughed when I sat down at the piano, but when I started to play. Now, anybody who's a prospect for this offer, which is you mail away to get a booklet to teach you how to uh, play an instrument, if you're a prospect, this is going to hook you because you want to play this instrument, but you're also, you know, a little bit scared. Of, of everything that could come with it. So they laughed when I sat down at the piano, but when I started to play is this incredible moment that you want to experience as this ideal prospect. So it's grabbing my attention. And because it's a good fit for me as somebody who wants to learn to play an instrument or just to impress people, um, it's powerful enough that I can't look away even if I want to. Now the best hooks also tap into things that make us uncomfortable when they're discussed in like, polite company. So a little bit uncomfortable. And this polite company thing is really important uh, for John Caples in particular, given his background, which we'll talk about uh, towards the end of today's tutorial. But here's what's going on in the hook. This hook is expressing um, a powerful but uncomfortable big idea. And that is a form of revenge. So this headline is going to work for almost anyone who's ever muttered like, I'll show them. That's what's going on here. That's what John Caples is tapping into. Now, it doesn't sound vengeful, right? That's an important thing too when you're when you're thinking of writing copy is you still have to you have to pull the prospect in and make them feel like you're aligned with them, you're on the same page. It's not bad, it's not dark. You're not saying, "Hey, get revenge on your enemies." That's not going to be necessarily the way in here. The way in is a much nicer scenario where the outcome is revenge. Another way to put revenge is restoration of justice, which might be a, a more accurate way to look at this. However, it is still a revenge story. Um, and that's an interesting thing to keep in mind when you're learning to write copy is it, it can be a little harder to figure out how to tap into this stuff. But once you know that that's what you're supposed to do, then you can play around with better headlines and hooks um, and better stories overall. Okay, so we've got these parts down. Then comes the lead, which was originally spelled L-E-D-E. -E, and I think if you work in journalism, you'll remember, you'll recognize it as L-E-D-E -E or lead, whatever. It's the opening line is a really simple way to look at it as an introduction to copywriting. It's really just the opening line. So in this example, the lead actually backs us up to the start of the story. So we are dropped in to the most interesting part of the story with the headline. They laughed when I sat down at the piano, but when I started to play, that's the interesting part. And there's something called the battlefield principle in copywriting, we teach that in copy school. Um, but what's really going on here is that the headline is dropping you into the action, whereas the lead is backing you up so that you're basically ready to now build out like you're watching the movie that gets you toward this climactic moment. Okay, so we have all of these parts. Then comes the body copy. Um, and we're not going to talk too much about body copy. What we're really doing here, what John Caples is doing here is a lot of storytelling to get you through this copy. And this works really well in ads. Like you can see this in social ads all the time. Um, and then we've got this crosshead here. So these, these bold centered areas are crossheads. Um, in this case, uh, what I want to point out here, if you're newer to copywriting, is that even in the 1920s, people were scanning. So if you look at this and you're like, wow, that's a lot of copy. Nobody would read that today. A lot, of, a lot of people weren't reading it back then either. But watch what's going on with the headline and the crosshead. So the headline reads, they laughed when I sat down at the piano, but when I started to play. Now, what if we are scanners and we just read the crossheads? You can see, then I started to play a complete triumph, how I learned to play without a teacher, play any instrument and send for our free booklet and demonstration lesson. 
I have the core of what I need to have, not to make a call necessarily, but to want to go back to the beginning and read the whole advertorial. So crossheads, working with your headline, this is, if you ever write long form sales pages, this is going to help you a lot. Um, the crossheads work together to basically tell you the story enough that you are likely to then go back to the beginning and maybe quickly read it, but still read it, give it a shot. So just know that if you look at this and you're like, this wouldn't fly today, it's doing all of the things that you need to do as well to get people to go back and read your copy. People who read are people who buy. Keep that in mind and that will help you as you navigate the weirdness of writing longer copy and wondering, oh man, will anybody read this? Crossheads will help people read it. Okay, so we have crossheads all over the place here. We have this, this little box here in the middle is just a call out box. It is not a Johnson box. That's also kind of intro copywriting, but just know that if you're like, oh, a call out box, I think that's the same thing as a Johnson box. Maybe you've heard of a Johnson box before. It's not, this is not trying to show you a, a part of the offer. It's not trying to do anything. A Johnson box will typically appear at the top of an ad. This is just a call out box that's saying, hey, these are the instruments that you could learn if you were to send away for this offer. Then this is the important distinction on what makes it not content, but copy. We have a close or closer section and then a call to action. So we're trying to get them to say yes to something. The whole story, everything that brought us here is to get them to a place where they're ready to say yes to this free booklet and demonstration lesson. And throughout this closer section, we have a lot of cool stuff going on. It opens with social proof. Thousands of successful students never dreamed they possessed musical ability until it was revealed to them by a remarkable musical ability test, which we send entirely without cost with our interesting free booklet. Um, it's a really great line. It's actually a pretty long line too, but it's doing a lot of cool stuff that if you go through and you read this all together after watching this tutorial, you can start to see some of the great stuff that's going on. Also, interestingly, is the font size changes as we go. That's a whole other thing. Um, but it's worth noting. And then we have the call to action as well. The actual part where we're saying, hey, this is what I want to get out of this. All right. Everything that is copy should have some version of a closing section and a call to action. Call to action. Now, what we're not talking about in this intro class is the importance of the offer. Now, the offer is everything. There's no chance John Cable started writing this without first fully understanding everything to do with the offer. So you should always start by writing out the offer, really understand the offer. If your client doesn't have a good offer or if you're writing your own copy and you're like, I don't even know what an offer is. Uh, we teach that in more tutorials. So stick around and have a look around on our YouTube channel or over on copyhackers.com. Um, but you need to have an offer. You need that offer to be compelling. You need people to want that offer. And just saying, hey, here's a free thing is not enough. Even in the 1920s, when there weren't nearly as many free things as there are today, even then it wasn't enough. John Capel still had to really work that offer to make it sound really compelling. So keep that in mind. Also an important note for a greater quantity of leads only include required fields. We can see that down at the bottom here, name, address, city, state. That's all we're really looking for. Um, and this question, have you above instrument because you're asked what instrument you want to learn? It's, I find it interesting phrasing. Okay, bonus tip, bonus. This is slightly more advanced, but this will make you feel more confident to know these little extra tips and tricks. Never end a headline or a crosshead with a full stop. You can see that throughout here, the crossheads don't have a period or even a question mark or anything else. And in the headline itself, it should end with just an exclamation point. They laughed when I sat down at the piano, but when I started to play, if it didn't have an exclamation point, it would feel weird. So he needed to put the exclamation point in, but that's a full stop. And that's actually a no-no because your headline is meant to get you to read the next line. Every line is meant, you, meant to get you to read the next line. So he adds this little tilde, I think that's how it's pronounced, uh, this little mark that shows, hey, we're not done. And there's this sense of incomplete. So I need to go complete. There's an opening-ish of a loop, or at least the loop has not closed. 
I want to read more. So keep that in mind. Never end with a full stop. Now that is the intro lesson. Um, keep in mind that the copy that most copywriters are writing today doesn't look like the John Capel's ad, but that does not mean that the copy we're writing today is better or is actually right. Definitely go back to the basics with a lesson like this by looking at the classic stuff that's out there that's managed to hold up over time. That was such a great lesson in copywriting when it first came out that it's just, it's shaped everybody since. Start there. Don't assume that where we are today is the ideal space to be. Also don't assume that John Capel's way was the ideal way either, but we do understand that that has been fundamental, it's foundational. It's where you should start when you're learning this stuff so that you can be inspired by it and make good ads, write good copy today. Uh, that's far more likely to get the yes. Now, quick notes on what we've not really covered, but what's important here, stories sell. First person headlines work. Go back through John Cable's ad and take a look at these. Design and art should support copy, not the other way around. So there's one hero section. It describes the image or the story that follows. It's an image of that story happening. If design had started, if art had started and said, hey, here's an image, go write copy for it. What the hell would John Cable's have done, right? So no, we start. We find the hook, we find the message. You can work with art as well to get there. But just know that if someone hands you like a wireframe and says, now fill in the copy, no, <laughs> that's not how it works. You can cover a lot of ground in fewer words than you think. This ad, although it might look long, is actually really tightly written. Um, you'll probably also though, need more words than you expected. If it doesn't bring, I don't know if you can hear my dog barking now, that's why I have this mic uh, so that you can hear our background stuff. Um, but if it doesn't bring the reader closer to saying yes to the offer, it does not belong on the page. And that's what we're talking about when we're editing long copy down. Final note, if it embarrasses your mother, you're doing it right. Now, this is, I mentioned, I was going to go back to John Capel's. He was raised by a very proper sort of family. Um, then he went into the city to be this copywriter. And he came home for the holidays, I believe it was. And he sat down with his mom in the kitchen and he opened up his book and was showing her his book. Um, and she's reading through it and looking at it. Um, and then she looks up at him and says, you better not show your father this. Now, I think that's a wonderful statement. His mom didn't realize just how amazing this work was and was like, oh my gosh, this is tapping into things that make me uncomfortable. This isn't polite. This isn't proper. And that's what we want to strive for when we're writing copy. So that is it for today's tutorial Tuesday. Um, hopefully it came through okay on uh, YouTube. We will wrap it up there. Next week, we'll figure out if we're going to live stream to YouTube or if we are not going to live stream to YouTube. Um, but for those who are here in Zoom, thank you for the uh, little emojis um, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Have a good